Uh, now, this was uh, the uh, uh, sort of like resource-based approach. Later on, two authors uh, that are uh, uh, still alive <laughs> compared to Penrose, which are uh, Dick Nelson and Sidney Winter, wrote a book in 1982, uh, which is called The Evolutionary uh, Theory of Economic Change, in which basically they start from Penrose and they develop what is nowadays called the evolutionary, uh, evolutionary approach to the theory of the fur. Okay. Um, um, such an approach takes inspiration from Penrose resource-based, uh, but it makes somewhat of a step further uh, based on the uh, sort of like uh, adding on top of some of the Penrose ideas concerning the heterogeneity of competences and resources uh, across firm, the idea of selection that instead is taken from uh, Darwin's uh, evolutionary uh, theory of species, okay? And, and it will be clearer what, will, uh, what I mean by this. But uh, basically, uh, as you will see, such an approach, so the evolutionary approach to the theory of the firm, is based on a non-simplistic link between uh, evolutionary fitness and economic efficiency. Uh, uh, where basically, um, uh, just, to, just to give you a basic idea, uh, 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 their, their main argument, uh, so, they, as I was saying, they, they based on Perrault's approach, so they, you have heterogeneity of the firm. No? So you have firm with some characteristics, some resources and some kind of capabilities, and other firm with other characteristics and other, um, uh, uh, other resources. Now, uh, the question is, given these differences across firm, uh, what defines which are the firm that will survive and expand their activities, and what defines uh, uh, what are the firms that will exit the market, okay? If you look into the standard approach to economics, um, neoclassical approach, uh, this question was there already, so they already asked this question, and their main idea was that, well, basically what defines selection of the firm is efficiency. So the most efficient firm, meaning the ones that can minimize costs will survive, those that cannot minimize costs will not survive, and therefore, this is basically how selection takes place across firm. Uh, their idea, however, uh, 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 Nelson and Winter's idea is that, uh, and this is taken from Darwin, uh, is not the most efficient firm that survive. That, if you read Darwin's book and if you study Darwin's uh, theory, uh, um, it was a completely uh, misunderstanding of Darwin's uh, that uh, so that led some people to suggest that the evolutionary theory, the Darwin's evolutionary theory, was suggesting that most efficient uh, people or most efficient uh, societies are the ones that survive. Darwin didn't say that the, the species that survive are the best ones or the most efficient. Darwin said that the species that survive are the fittest one meaning the one that can adapt best to their environment, okay? This does not imply necessarily that these species are also the best one or that are particularly efficient, okay? So Nick, uh, Dick Nelson and Sidney Winter took this idea from Darwin and they applied it to the selection taking place across firms. And they said, well, it, you do have heterogeneity across firms that depends on the fact that there are some firms with some characteristics, some resources and capabilities, and some other with other characteristics. You do have selection taking place across firms, but what drives selection is not efficiency, is fitness. And the firms that will survive and expand their business are not the best, are not the most efficient, are just the fittest one, meaning the one that can basically uh, adapt best their uh, uh, business to the, con uh, the surrounding environment. And here again, the link with the COVID experiences that they are living today is very important, it's very interesting, because uh, if you apply the uh, sort of like um, standard approach, one may be, uh, 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 may be uh, uh, led to argue that, well, of course, there are lots of costs that comes from an uh, economic crisis like the one we are experiencing nowadays, but one good point is that, thanks to this crisis, all the inefficient firms that are less uh, profitable will exit the market and you will sort of like clean up the economy 
uh, allowing only the most efficient firms to survive. But if you look at this problem with the perspective of the evolutionary approach, well, this is not necessarily the case, okay? What we, you will see that the firms that are better in adapting to the environment are the one that will survive, but this does not necessarily mean that this firm will also be the best one or the most efficient. Actually, there is evidence of the contrary because, and this, I, I'm not going to the detail of this, but uh, myself with some uh, co-author, even from our uh, uh, department like Professor Arrighetti and Lasagne, we are doing research, we've been doing research on this, looking at the last crisis, so the one that started in 2009, 2008, and what we uh, observed is that actually, especially in the manufacturing sectors in Italy, the firms that survive are not necessarily the uh, most efficient, but are, of, of course, efficient firms have a survival premium, but there are also several other firms that, for instance, operate in very small niche markets, in protected economies, in protected uh, segments of the economy, that, can, that are not particularly efficient, but they are very flexible in adapting their production activities and that can easily survive in a, in, even uh, in a very uh, problematic context like the one of an economic crisis. Okay, so uh, the very important contribution uh, from uh, Nelson and Winter with respect to industrial dynamics is exactly this idea that what drives selection of the firm is not efficiency, is not profit, but is actually fitness. Okay. Um, okay, now, uh, looking a little bit more into the detail of this uh, national winter theory, and with this we will uh, get close to the, uh, to the uh, application of this theory to multinational companies, which is, as I was saying, the main aim of our analysis. Um, now, national winter theory is actually based on three main pillars that define and uh, what firm uh, are doing and how select selection takes place. And here you will see some uh, degree of uh, the, the links that exist from this approach uh, um, uh, and uh, the approach by uh, Penrose. First, they argue that firm operates through what they call routines. What are routines? Are forms, rules, procedures, conventions, strategies, and technologies around which organizations are constructed and through which they operate. Okay, and this definition is taken by a contribution by Levitt and March uh, from 1988. So basically, routines are a set of rules that can be formal, so they can be specified, for instance, in the um, uh, uh, in the um, uh, let's say uh, in the in, in in the contracts that people sign when they start to uh, work for a company, but can also be uh, informal, like uh, social norms, convention that are defined at the level of the company, okay, uh, around which, uh, uh, let's say, uh, organization of activities takes place, okay? And uh, again, uh, I don't know if you have uh, experience of working in a company. I did work for a company before starting my academic uh, um, uh, career, if you want. Uh, while I was uh, still a student in my uh, master's degree, I worked for one year in Brussels in a consulting company, and... Uh, and actually, I, I do see that uh, this way of defining how things are done in the company, it's actually very real. Okay, so if I look at my own experience when I was working in this company, I do really see that, that, that there were formal rules because, for instance, my contracts define who was my supervisor. So who was the person uh, that was supposed to give uh, directions to my work. But at the same time, there were a lots of more sort of like social norms, cultural norms, and, 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 and unspecified rules that were defining what I was supposed to do in my job, okay? And, and, and these are factors that, for instance, played an important role in, in defining... Uh, so when I was working in this company, we were organizing different teams, and each of, them, uh, of these was supposed to uh, apply for a uh, call for uh, proposal that were coming from the European Commission, to organize a sort of like pool of experts that were supposed to be involved in uh, consulting activities related to developing uh, uh, to projects uh, that were uh, targeted towards developing countries. Okay, so there were, we were different teams organized uh, depending on different sort of like subjects and teams. So there was the team 
that was dealing with health policies, the team that was um, dealing with economic policies, and I was working in this one, and things like that. And of course, there was sort of like some degree of competition across the different teams, depending on uh, how many calls you could win uh, uh, with your uh, applications. And uh, the social norms and cultural norms made a big difference in the success of these different teams. And also, why? Well, because they, these different social norms and cultural norms, they were affecting the way in which things were organized in the different teams. Okay, So I, I really see that uh, this way of approaching how things are done in a company is uh, pretty realistic, even though this is uh, the cost of using this approach, it's very difficult to study in a formal or mathematical way as it is done, for instance, in, in standard microeconomic models. There are formal models about uh, routines that, and that are applied to evolutionary theory. I did uh, some uh, of them, I did myself, but of course it is, from the mathematic point of view, are uh, pretty difficult. Okay. Uh, uh, and that's why, for instance, uh, again, I, I open a bracket here, um, uh, usually uh, people using formal models to study a, a firm using the evolutionary approach, they don't use a, a sort of like analytical model like you have in microeconomic uh, uh, works, but they use simulation models. So uh, the idea is that these models become uh, too, too difficult to be solved in an analytical way, so you use computer simulation to simulate uh, what is going on in the model. Okay, but okay, uh, if those who are interested in this can be just uh, drop me a mail and we can discuss about that because again, I'm very uh, fond of this type of um, uh, research.